Hey everyone, it's Trappleton. Have you enabled Secure Boot on your computer? Because I sure have, but what is it? And why is it so important to the fabric of computing today? Why is Windows 11 pushing Secure Boot so hard? Is it a way for Microsoft to block off third-party operating systems like Linux? Did someone on a forum or Discord tell you to turn it off? All of this and more as we take a deep dive together as to why UEFI and Secure Boot should be mandatory and required for anyone running a computer in today's day and age. But of course, the first question that comes up is what is the UEFI and Secure Boot? Desktop computers are exposed to constant threats in the wild. And one of the worst things that could be compromised is your boot process for something like your phone or your computer that contains critical information. We want to keep that stuff locked down to prevent the bad guys from getting in. And I'm going to go through this in a brief, really ultra simplified explanation because all computerized systems are broken up into three major layers. First, we have things like your hardware. And your hardware is typically made up of your computer and the components that make up your computer, like your fans or your graphics card, or even the Intel or AMD or Apple Silicon chip in inside. We also have your operating system, and this can be something like Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, depending on what kind of computer you have, where you can make changes to your computer and how it functions. But how does your operating system system interact with your hardware so that you can make changes to it either through things like your graphics card or your monitors well this is all done through your bios which operates as a single point of trust to handle your peripherals and your connection from your operating system and your hardware and your BIOS typically manifests itself as an ugly looking interface that's usually really confusing and drowns you in a lot of language you probably don't understand. And I'm not going to pretend that I understand it either. But while booting up a computer used to start off really simple in the ye old early days of computing, it has become more and more complex as time has gone on. Previous older iterations were things like the Extensible Firmware Interfaces, or EFI, which was a miniaturized operating system which vastly increased the capability between your operating system and your BIOS. And UEFI is the new evolution of EFI, and the U and the UEFI unified the complexity of EFI. UEFI is also the trusted version of EFI. You can rely on your firmware to know that if your computer is booting up, it's properly booting up and not doing something sketchy or suspicious in the process. UEFI is built off of a chip on your motherboard which adds cryptographic authentications to your actively running devices and hardware and it makes sure that everything is initialized properly. We need UEFI because many corporations view UEFI as the continuation and future of EFI past the early 2000s. This added cryptographic verification actually presented a new frontier to device makers. Personal computing devices like your computer or phone contain incredibly lucrative information to attackers. So the big operating system vendors like Windows and their OEMs and Apple had to invest in protecting the sanctity of your system. And this started with the platform initialization standard. The platform initialization standard generates a key typically pre-baked in from your motherboard's manufacturer, which attests that the firmware on your motherboard is indeed valid and has not been tampered with. Inside, there's all sorts of protections that protect your firmware and your motherboard and your bootloader from time stamping changes, modifications, or rolling back to older versions of firmware. Secure Boot uses UEFI's keys and ties it to the pre-baked keys that are created by your motherboard manufacturer to add an extra layer of security against malware that's exploiting the boot process. And it's really similar to the pre-built keys that you find in your browser that typically make up things like the fabric of the internet as we know it today. Things like the certificate authorities that provide us all the websites we know, like Amazon and Microsoft and Google and Digicert and Komodo. 
This also validates that the operating system you boot up is precisely the intended operating system, as it originally was when you first powered it down, and that no malicious code has burrowed its way in between or into your bootloader as your device boots up and causes a persistent rootkit to sit in your computer. <laughs> this is also why there's a key store containing forbidden keys inside motherboards. So if a key has ever been revoked by a user, like say for example, an attack being exploited in the wild, it's added to a blacklist to make sure that those malicious keys or the revoked keys can't ever be used again. This isn't hypothetical of course, because state sponsored attacks and some very limited attacks in the wild take advantage of all the people who haven't quite caught up to these standards yet. The Chinese research company Chihu360 reported on UEFI rootkits taking advantage of the backwards compatibility modules in Asus's computers. For example, most motherboards contain backwards compatibility, so if a system that is currently running EFI can boot on a system which is typically UEFI by default. And attackers take advantage of the EFI booting that's part of the compatibility module because EFI is not secured compared to UEFI and of course that makes EFI the weakest link in the boot security chain. More recently, the Russian security firm Kaspersky found another rootkit with yet another vulnerability targeting the compatibility module for EFI and UEFI. And also, it's once again an ASUS and Gigabyte motherboards. Because if you thought ASUS shorting their motherboards and Gigabyte getting their firmware backdoored, because these sophisticated attacks are nothing compared to the way Secure Boot was widely introduced to the public and it all started with the dreaded operating system Windows 8 under the iron fist of Steven Sanofsky who began to require Microsoft compliant UEFI secure boot and in a classic poorly worded style of Microsoft communication from the madman himself Steven Sanofsky added just a tiny little clause with these requirements. In the screenshot below, you will notice that we designed the firmware to allow the customer to disable secure boot. However, doing so comes at your own risk. OEMs are free to choose how to enable this support and can further customize the parameters as described in an effort to deliver unique value propositions to their customers. And this last line got major Linux manufacturers seriously concerned because history has shown that OEMs often cut a lot of corners to ship their firmware. And what if the ability to boot something other than Windows, like say Linux, was taken away? Papers from Red Hat and Canonical described how the ability to write and add custom signing keys needed to be added into Microsoft's requirements so OEMs could allow for operating systems other than Windows to boot, as this would have negative impact on the, de the minor percentage of desktop Linux users and, but more importantly, the server users. In the original build blog post, Sanofsky actually does talk about this at the beginning. The problem is it contradicts the line that everyone focused on which immediately followed and this is why everyone got so worried. Once again, Microsoft does not know how to communicate to anyone. Secure boot doesn't lock out operating system loaders, but it is a policy that allows firmware to validate the authenticity of components. Microsoft doesn't mandate or control the settings on PC firmware that control or enable secured boot from any operating system other than Windows. And this quote probably provides the intended meaning to Microsoft's users, which is, you can turn off secure boot, but you do so at your own risk. If you examine the papers by Red Hat and Canonical very carefully, you will see that they don't reject secure boot as a standard, but it, secure boot needed to be done in such a way where Microsoft doesn't completely control the process and done in an inclusive way to allow Linux users to get access to secure boot. 
And to this day, in the comments, on places like Reddit, I mean, what's left of it anyway, Discord, or 4chan, I continue to hear that using Secure Boot doesn't work if you don't use Windows, especially on Linux. And while that might have been true at one point, it hasn't been true for over a decade now. I can guarantee that the vast majority of Linux users disabled Secure Boot either because they didn't know what it was or a guide online told them to. In fact, I caught this guide from some guys on the Garuda Linux team telling their users to disable Secure Boot. And not just on this little tiny little post on their forums that I cherry picked, you will find this on multiple locations on not just their forums, but also on their Telegram group, which just borders on irresponsible. Because yes, Secure Boot on Linux can be done. It's even more ironic on top of this that the two most popular desktop Linux distributions, Fedora and Ubuntu, and by proxy, their derivatives like Linux Mint or Nobara, for example, have never been subject to not having access to secure boot. Red Hat and Canonical have to cough up a one-time $99 fee to get a third-party Microsoft shim key, which allows their users, i.e. Fedora, Red Hat, and Ubuntu users, full access to secure boot. This third-party shim key that Fedora pays for is not just used by them, but it's also used by other distributions, like say, for example, Ventoy, which allows not just compatible Linux distributions, but Windows 11 to take advantage of Secure Boot out of the box with very little intervention. <laughs> Secure Boot also works out of the box on Intel and AMD, but Secure Boot on Linux breaks if you use third-party kernel drivers, and this usually contains things like the NVIDIA drivers, VirtualBox, or V4L2 loopback. <laughs> And in Fedora, Fedora contains a special program called AK Mods. AK Mods allows you to generate your own signing key and sign the Linux kernel, thus allowing you to use the proprietary NVIDIA driver, VirtualBox, and V4L2 loopback all flawlessly while going through Secure Boot correctly. I wrote two little scripts based on a guide from the folks at RPM Fusion that automates the process of you writing your own kernel signing key so that you can gain access to Secure Boot while using the proprietary NVIDIA driver on Fedora. Once you enroll the keys and reboot, you'll open a program called MOKUtil, which looks like a big blue screen. And once you go through here, if you continue with the key and proceed with the password that you set up, you can automatically set up Secure Boot with proprietary proprietary NVIDIA driver. If you use something like Ubuntu or OpenSUSE, you might not have to take any action because Ubuntu and OpenSUSE have scripts built into their installers which automate the secure boot signing process. And I'm going to leave it here because instead of making straw man arguments, uh, against random people online claiming secure boot is going to lock people out. We need to accept these new standards like UEFI and secure boot because they're realities that we all need to wake up to. It's something that's really easy to do. And I didn't even get to the part where Windows and Linux are just so far behind compared to Macs and mobile devices. And I'm just going to leave it at that or else I'm going to go on forever. So why don't you go leave a like on this video? Leave a like on this video if you hated the Windows 11 era. And subscribe if you also want to hear about all the useless internal things on your computer you probably never touched in a million years. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Have a great rest of your week.